everyone, and welcome to Filene's Villain. I'm Sheila Milton, Director of Cultural Competency and Inclusion here at UW Credit Union. The Filene Fill-In is the podcast where Filene fills in their listeners on what's going on within Filene and around the financial services world. On January 13th, 2020, Filene officially launched its new Center of Excellence for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, led by Dr. Quinita Roberson of Villanova University. UW Credit Union is a supporter of the center. This is a five-year research project to explore DEI opportunities and challenges for credit unions to better serve their members and attract, retain, and develop top talent. DEI research is not new to credit unions, nor is it new to Filene. Past Filene work that is related to this effort includes research on women in leadership, financial services for low-income populations or people of color, and how financial institutions can serve the LGBT community. We also know that there are many others in the credit union system making important contributions in these areas. Nonetheless, there still remains much work to be done. The work of this center will build upon this foundation to conduct applied research to help the industry understand how to leverage diversity, equity, and inclusion to create business value and drive performance. And UW Credit Union couldn't be more excited to let you get to know a bit more about Filene's new research fellow who will be leading this work. Dr. Quinita Roberson is the Fred J. Springer Endowed Chair in Business Leadership and Professor of Management at Villanova University. Filene's Taylor Nims and Holly Faring got some time with her to talk about why this research is so important and how she came to find her passion for being a researcher and teacher. I already knew that the work we were embarking on through this research would be a game changer for us and for the credit union industry, but it really fills my heart with a feeling of purpose after getting a chance to talk with her a little bit. I'm very excited to see what we can do together, and I hope that you'll walk away feeling inspired and wanting to move this work forward. Okay, I just first want to start off by thanking you so much, Quinetta, for agreeing to introduce yourself to our credit union audience by being interviewed on our podcast today. And I wanted to welcome you to the Filene Fellow family. As you know, you are our newest Filene Fellow for our Center for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So I wanted to start us off with just a little bit from you, just talking about what that means to you to be leading Filene's research on diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially for financial services, and just Tell us like the high level around, you know, what that really means. Yeah, I, I mean, you mentioned three things that I'm the newest filing fellow for the Center of Excellence for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. And I think in that highlights the reasons why I'm so excited. One, I think that my background in diversity, equity, and inclusion it is a passion of mine. I've done research in the space, teaching in the space, consulting in this space. I'm the one continuously over the last 20 years pushing that boulder up the hill, one of the people that's doing that. And so being able to continue that work is exciting. Of course, working with Filene is exciting given all of the work that Filene does in the credit union space, all of the really thought-provoking and groundbreaking research that Filene does. And so to partner with Filene is exciting. But then, of course, being the newest, um, there's some cachet associated with that. So I, I'm excited to kind of trailblaze in that way as well. Excellent. Well, welcome. Taylor, how did we come across Dr. Roberson for this role? Well, we first came into touch with Quinetta through her relationship with a current fellow of Filene's, Sekou Burmese, at the University of Texas, Austin, who leads the Center for uh, the War for Talent. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Dr. Robertson and Dr. Burmese have a little bit of a history in the academic world. So maybe, Quinetta, you can tell us a little bit about how you first came into contact with Filene, and then I'll be happy to sort of talk a little bit about how we um, made the choice around who to lead the Center for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Sure. I am. Um, 
It's interesting because I've known Sekou for a while, and I actually remember when it was announced that he was going to be a filing fellow. I remember seeing it on Twitter, and I was like, ooh, what's that about? And um, we talked about it, and I was asking him, what does he have to do, et cetera? And I said, I want in on it. And he's like, are you serious? And I said, yeah. And he... Um, he saw an opportunity later when there was a colloquium, the America's Got Talent colloquium at the University of Texas at Austin. And I um, attended or I was invited to give a talk. And that is probably how that relationship with Filene began. And when I came on board um, at Filene and started the process of planning the new Centers of Excellence, the transition to new centers of excellence, we started to explore the academic space around diversity, equity, and inclusion research. We reached out to Sekou, and he recommended that we take a look at Quinetta's portfolio. I read as much as I could of Quinetta's work, um, and it is, it's impossible to read it all because she is profoundly prolific, but was immediately struck by a couple of things. One, her research is top-notch. It's published in some of the leading you know, management, organizational studies, and other um, disciplinary journals. It's profoundly relevant to um, industry, and um, it's translatable. Some of the insights from uh, Quinetta's research are immediately actionable for organizations and, and um, across disciplines, across industries, but especially financial services, in part because uh, Quinetta herself has a background in financial services. And so, you know, when we were reviewing candidates, uh, potential candidates to lead the Center for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, it's, it was very quickly clear that Quinetta had everything that we thought it was going to take to be a leader for credit unions and to lead the research agenda for Filene. Well, we're certainly glad that all of that worked out to lead you and us to where we are now. I know that there's a lot of excitement around this topic and also a lot of hype around this topic. I know that our credit union audience is going to be really kind of eager to get to know you, Quinetta, and, and kind of where you come from and your perspective into this work. So can you start with a little bit of background on you around, you know, what led you to do this type of research and what your background of study is? Yeah, well, as Taylor mentioned, I have a background in the financial services. Um, in high school, and I, I don't know if you wanted me to go back this far, but in high school, I took an accounting class and I decided that I was going to be an accountant. Um, and so that was my major in college until I took tax. And I was like, oh, um, <laughs> what else can I do <laughs> that's related, but I don't have to do this stuff. Um, but I stumbled upon finance and I really liked finance, um, financial analysis, uh, investments in capital markets. And so I ended up getting a degree in finance with a minor in accounting. Um, I then went to get my MBA and I majored in um, or concentrated in finance and then got my first job as a financial analyst at a regional bank. And interestingly, that was like the early 90s and we were just starting to hear about diversity. Not that it wasn't a thing. Um, we know that the world was changing in terms of the demography of the workforce. But we didn't hear much about that term diversity. And so you saw a lot of organizations, particularly driven by the war for talent that McKinsey put out and data on the changing demographics of the workforce that said, you know, we need to be able to deal with this trend. And I was actually at a bank that had a diversity initiative, which was pretty forward thinking at that time. And I got to be involved in it. And, you know, I did that for a couple of years, but then my bank was going through a right sizing 
and they were looking for people to voluntarily leave. And I asked myself two questions. What am I best at? What am I best? And, and what do I love? And so the answer to both of those were school. So I tried to devise a way to be in school for the rest of my life, hence becoming a professor. And I found that, you know, people often say we study our lives. But I found myself wanting to understand this diversity phenomenon a bit more. And so I studied issues of diversity. I studied issues of fairness and fair treatment in organizations. We didn't have the term inclusion at the time that kind of evolved. But that was my foundation or my impetus for getting into this work. And Quinetta, tell us a little bit about how you... First of all, my understanding is that you uh, got your MBA very young, so you could tell us a little bit about that. But also, could you tell us a little bit about how you alighted on research as a passion um, yeah. and thinking about <laughs> you know your time you know in a bank and maybe you know, working in lending and how was it that research you know really resurfaced as a passion for you? This is so um, <laughs> I know I, I know I probably told you this story. I don't tell many people the story, um, but I did get my MBA by the time I was 21. Uh, that was always a goal of mine. I went to college when I was 16. I graduated college when I was 20. I wanted to get an MBA by the time I was 21. I'm an overachiever. But then <laughs> <I'll> also <say> <laughs> I, um, I felt that I was too young to work. So I was like, I'll just keep going to school until I feel like it's time. Um, it was kind of interesting, though, because here I am in classes with all of my colleagues who were saying, hey, do you want to go to happy hour after class? And I couldn't go. I'm like, <laughs> have fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, so I went to the University of Pittsburgh, which had a, an 11 month uh, MBA program. So. It helped me realize my dream. Um, and that one year, I guess, was pretty enlightening for me where I said, you know what, I feel like I can work now. And I was, as I mentioned, a financial analyst. But I, um, I don't know, I felt like I was executing and, and implementing, but I wasn't necessarily inventing or creating. And I wanted to be in that environment, because I know that that's what drives me. I love, I love the process of discovery. And I stumbled upon an announcement that said that um, a professional organization was having a paper competition. So I decided to enter. And what I did was I would get to work by 7 a.m. so that I could finish my work by 1 and then spend the rest of the afternoon in the library working on my paper. And after about six weeks of that, um, two things happened. One, I won the paper competition. Uh, in hindsight, I basically was pitching the idea of an, uh, a virtual bank. I think I created ING, but I didn't create it. So <laughs> <there's>, <laughs> that's why I got to work for my money now. Um, <laughs> but um, the second thing that happened was that I had to go back to work. And I was I was sad that I didn't have any research to do. I had no reason to be in the library every day. And so that really gave me some insight into myself. And so when the opportunity came to leave and to, you know, think about going back to school, I really, you know, had to do some reflection. And I thought, you know, in answering those questions, what can I do that really um, fuels that passion where I can, where research is sub key or primary part of my job. And that's how I pursued um, getting the PhD and becoming a professor. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. You know, as we think about your research on, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, first on diversity and, and equity, and then later, you know, as inclusion became a more important part of the industry and, and, and research scene, you know, could you tell us a little bit about how and why DEI has become so important in business? You know, how is it a business imperative? And why are so many businesses investing and, and sometimes struggling to approach it um, effectively? I think that when we first heard about diversity, probably in the 90s and early 2000s, it was the right thing to do. And 
it was that, you know, there needed to be this level playing field. When we consider all the differences that exist in the workforce, how do we make it so that everyone is represented in an organization and has the ability to contribute? I think that then organizations started thinking about it in terms of, um, you know, we heard some about the business case. So how can this relate to the business? And one of the key ways we saw was in marketing, for example. We knew that with the changes in society, the demographic changes that not only changed the workforce, but it changed consumer markets as well. So how do we better understand how to serve those consumer markets and, you know, in the process, be able to grow market share, be able to increase revenues, et cetera. But then I think with the when the economy changed, probably around 2008, we really saw ourselves in a place where what got measured got done and anything that was a cost center that wasn't generating revenues really started to be trimmed down. And those things, particularly those talent initiatives, were being scrutinized to see, are they making us money? And so that really made the business case or the business imperative even more important. So you saw organizations really looking inward to say, what is this doing, right? Where are we either losing money or not making money? Where are we leaving money on the table or missing opportunities? And they started to really tie it to their performance and effectiveness. And I think that's where we are now. Organizations are still trying to struggle to understand that. And part of it is, you know, having a strategic perspective. A lot of times organizations don't think about DE and I as a part of a business, but something that's more standalone, something that's, you know, under the umbrella of talent, but it's a practice. It's very practice driven. And so that's where part of the struggle comes in to understand really how can this create value in an organization? How can it actually help to drive organizational effectiveness, drive growth and drive performance. I'm glad that you are driven by a passion to focus on research because I know that we have a lot to research on this topic yet. And like you said, I think that there's, it's no new concept, not even in the business context around diversity, equity and inclusion being part of the workplace and that it is adding definite, tangible business value, but it still seems to be something that's misunderstood or inaccurately, um, you know, attempted to be um, strategized. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to like, what is it that's so difficult about it that what is misunderstood in a business context around DE&I and why is it, while we know it's so important, why is it something that businesses continue to struggle with? I think there's three reasons that businesses struggle with DEI. The first is just the concepts. To some degree, I hear people say diversity, equity, and inclusion as if it's one word, and they treat it accordingly. So they become this one thing. We manage diversity, equity, and inclusion, and by lumping them together, there's no understanding of really what that's about. Or what happens is that they become interchangeable. We manage diversity, we manage equity, we manage inclusion without necessarily understanding the complete picture. It just becomes this thing that we do. And this thing is often delegated to someone else. It's delegated to the HR department. It's delegated to the chief diversity officer. Again, it seems to be an initiative or a practice rather than something that's part of the DNA of organizations. And so with that, a lot of people will look at it and say, what's in it for me? Or actually say that doesn't have anything to do with me. But everyone has skin in the game. There is a, you know, diversity, managing diversity is incumbent upon all of us. If I'm on a team that is, you know, people of different geographical locations, different functional backgrounds, different tenures in the organization, then we need to try to figure out how to effectively work together. That's what diversity is about. 
And how do we leverage those differences in order to create some kind of magic and some kind of synergy that is better than we could be individually? But I don't think people necessarily think about it that way. Again, it becomes very practice driven. Oh, we have diversity training. Oh, we have coaching and mentoring. Oh, we have this recruitment initiative to increase the number of X. But it's not necessarily thought about as a whole thing that relates to what the organization does. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit more about what you see the differences between diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then at the same time, why it's so important that they're kind of all together as a unit? Yeah, um, (laughs) I was just at this conference about a week ago, and, and I don't know if you've ever heard this like dance metaphor. It's like diversity is being asked to the dance, and inclusion is about being asked to dance and equity is about having your music played. There's something and it's like the worst <laughs> metaphor ever. Uh, <laughs> <Sounds like. laughs> it's terrible. But, but um, <laughs> there's, um, so diversity is about any difference, right? Um, I mentioned a few diversity of thinking, functional background, tenure, age, people will talk about gender, race, It could be any difference. Sometimes I'll talk about left-handed versus right-handed. And if I say left-handed versus right-handed, there are some people say, whoa, wait a minute. Now you're diluting the definition. But in some of my work environments, right-handed versus left-handed is important. Because if I'm working in a classroom, if I'm teaching a classroom that has individual desks, and most of the desks in there tend to be right-handed desks, then my left-handed students have to navigate those right-handed desks. What I notice is that if I have them work with a partner or talk to someone in the room, they rarely talk to the person on their left side because they're so busy navigating the right-handed desk, that person becomes, it becomes a barrier to the person on their left side. They exclude that person. They're just naturally closer to the person on their right. And I note that because that's what inclusion is about. Inclusion is about the opportunity for everyone to be fully contributing members and meaningfully contributing members of an organization. But we need to have equitable systems and practices and tools in order for people to be able to do that. So, you know, I've seen leaders say, well, I'm inclusive. And when I ask them what they do, there's nothing really actionable in it. And sometimes they need those, you know, we need to look to make sure that it's not just what the way leaders are interacting with their direct reports, but thinking about are the practices, are any of our employees falling by the wayside or being marginalized or unable to contribute just by the nature of the way we go about doing business or our talent management practices. So DEI are all related, but you kind of need them to tell a complete story. You have the differences, but you have to make sure that the systems don't throw you know, anybody out of the opportunity system or prevent them from having access. And inclusion is, you know, making sure that there's an environment where they feel respected and valued and welcome and really are motivated and engaged to be able to make those contributions. Yeah, it sounds like there are there are clear links between these three concepts and the way that they manifest in reality. And you know, for example, it's clear that it, in any group of people, in any organization, you're going to have lots of different kinds of differences. Mm-hmm. But it's the systems of inclusion and equity that are going to structure which ones produce exclusion, which ones come to matter as differences, and which are um, simply a part of people's relationships um, that go kind of unmarked, right? So, you know, yeah. can you tell us a little bit about how and why diversity has to come alongside kind of inclusion and equity in order to have an impact for both organizations and for individuals? You know, it's interesting. From a research standpoint, I study equity first. So before I was really studying diversity, because you didn't see a lot of it in the research literature, I was studying issues of equity. So who gets treated fairly versus who gets treated unfairly? Or, you know, how, what are the different types of relationships managers will have with members of their team? 
And that's pure, you know, again, fairness, that's equity. But people assume that diversity is then this separate kind of thing. But when we, you know, I'll hear organizations say we need more diversity. And what they may be saying is, you know, we don't have a representation of women in our workforce that represents our customer base or that represents um, where we operate in terms of geographic location, but there's diversity in every organization and it's figuring out how it influences the work that gets done. Um, and then the equity is do all of those people, regardless of characteristics or background, have the same opportunities and the same access to information and those opportunities. So then, to me, those two are related and they're already there. So the secret sauce becomes inclusion, right? That's the systemic thing. That's the word that you just said, Taylor, that like kind of brings it all together and makes sure that everything is running the way it should so that every single person can be his or her best at work or in whatever the environment is. And so I say that, you know, reflecting on really research does not link these three, these three things together. I can't think of any study right now. So here's, you know, probably goal number one or task number one for us. Um, but there's nothing to show that diversity, equity and inclusion reinforce each other. But when we look at the way organizations operate, they are, you know, they do reinforce each other. And so it's kind of showing it's it's linking that research and practice and be able to show why this is, you know, the trifecta in order for people to really be effective and for organizations to be effective overall. Yeah, I'm really struck by this notion that whether you realize it or not, you're making decisions about diversity and equity and probably inclusion and exclusion, right? Whether you're being explicit or intentional or being implicit and really haphazard and unintentional, right? The choices that you make in an organization, whether they're inward facing or outward facing, are going to have implications for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, you know, part of the job is to really surface how important it is to be explicit and intentional about the choices that you're making from a DEI perspective. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, from your perspective, maybe these are hypotheses, but, you know, from your perspective, what are some of those firm level benefits or value that really careful, explicit, and intentional approach to DEI might have? Well, I did research about 15 years ago, I, I used to teach a diversity course and I would invite guest speakers in and usually sometime within the first five uh, PowerPoint slides, they would tell me how many X they had in leadership or on their board. So we've got this many women, we have this many you know, racial minorities and or they would tell me how many diversity awards they won. <laughs> and just after seeing that time and time again, I was like, so what, right? I, I, what, what, why does this matter? And so being the researcher, I set out to, you know, test that to see, does it have any impact on financial performance? And that was an opportunity for me to kind of combine my passion for diversity work with my financial background. And the punchline is that I found a relationship but it was a curvilinear relationship or a U-shaped relationship, which basically says at lower levels of diversity. So the inflection point was about 22%. If you had less than 22% women or minorities on your leadership team, you actually saw a decrease in financial performance. But around 22, 24%, you saw an, an increase. So why is that? Why if we have some diversity, it actually decreases what we do um, or our effectiveness, our financial performance. But at a certain point, it enhances it. And what we speculate is that it's this issue of critical mass 
and also using diversity. And so, you know, there are some organizations that will say, hey, we have a female COO. We have a, you know, um, uh, Asian American woman who leads our um, marketing department. And I'm like, okay, and what? But if in the, if they're just using that person or valuing that person for their group membership, they're kind of wasting the beauty or the benefits of diversity. They're not taking into consideration that person's unique skill set or background or knowledge or network, all of these things that diversity brings. And so my research shows that there is a relationship to financial performance in terms of uh, top line growth revenues, in terms of bottom line growth, net income, you know, it actually has some efficiency outcomes. It improves uh, organizations' financial returns, return on assets, return on investment, but it doesn't talk about how that happens. And so the organizations that do this well are able to think about where are the value creating areas of their organization, where those meaningful positions or those mission critical, where mission critical work is being done and making sure that they're leveraging diversity in those spaces in particular to get out the better problem solving, the creativity, the innovation, all of the things that we know that come from diversity and being able to leverage that in order to get to the firm performance. As I'm listening to you talk about this, I, I feel like there's kind of this this underlying foundation under the concepts of DE and I around power dynamics and essentially who makes decisions. Do you feel like that has anything to do with when it's in a workplace context that naturally has hierarchical structures and there are people that make decisions on behalf of other people and there are leaders? Does that complicate the ability to um, really fulfill the ideas of DE&I? It definitely, I think power and status can be dimensions of diversity themselves. Um, we can see different industries that are really diverse in terms of demographics. But if you took a slice of those organizations, the diversity is concentrated either in certain areas of the business or at the lower levels. So without that diversity being kind of infused throughout the organization, Again, it's we're not realizing the full benefits. Mm -hmm. The other thing to your point, Holly, I think is really interesting is that this issue of like hierarchy or level in the organization or where people even are in, ter in terms of areas of the business can often drive their experience. You know, what do they have access to? Who do they have access to? What conversations are they a part of? What promotion opportunities do they have or development opportunities? And so that becomes a diversity dimension in and of itself. That level changes people's experience um, in the organization. And so part of inclusion is understanding how people's experience at work differs depending on where they are, what their job title is. And those are all things that relate to power and status. Mm -hmm. So clearly it's very complex. And uh, I think that there's a lot of different angles to take at this. So I wanted to get your thoughts on kind of in this work as the fellow for the center, what are some of the things that you're most looking forward to getting into in these first few months of work in this role? And then also kind of looking in the long game five years down the road, what is your hope that we might have then that we don't have now? Oh, gosh. So um, <laughs> as you have so astutely noted, there's so much to be done. But just in our initial planning, we've tried to identify what we think would be some really impactful initiatives and outputs for the center. One is this 
concept paper on DEI so that people understand what they are and, and what they're doing. In the credit union industry, and I think it's, this is the same across industries, there needs to be this common framework or this common basis of operating. So we're all talking about the same thing. And so one of the initial things we want to do is to talk about diversity, to talk about equity, to talk about inclusion, to talk about what the relationship is between them. What are some of the outcomes? What are some of the challenges? And then, you know, what are some things to think about as we do this work going forward? So that's meant to be our foundational work. But then, like as I mentioned, I've done work to understand what's the value for DEI and organizations in terms of how does it drive performance. And I have, my research shows that there are certain, you know, value creating areas. For example, we know that diversity brings about greater innovation and creativity. And so maybe having diversity in an R&D space is important. Or if you are a very service driven industry, making sure that there is diversity, equity, inclusion in those places that have direct or frequent touch with consumers. Even though I have an idea of what that looks like across organizations in general, I think what excites me about this fellowship and being able to work with Feline is the unique business model and the fact that we're talking about this environment, this cooperative financial environment that's owned and operated by members, which is very unique. And so what do DE and I look like among different stakeholders? So not only among employees, but among members. Thinking about what does that do in terms of providing member service, current members, their member experience, but also attracting new members. So I think that there's some unique features of credit unions and unique value creating areas. And so we want to come up with this value based framework for understanding how DEI can drive performance and success in credit unions. We also talked about um, a benchmarking survey that, you know, there seems to be many credit unions who, you know, everyone's can be on a DEI journey, but they'll be at different stages and they want to know, you know, where they are relative to other credit unions. They want to know, you know, where should they be applying their focus and their resources at that point of their journey. And so we think that it could be important to do some data collection and some benchmarking to get an idea of the current state of DEI and credit unions and give people a way to measure progress. Those are the three major things we talked about. We also talked about it'd be interesting to have some more qualitative data, maybe some case studies on um, credit unions, DEI journeys that people can, you know, understand that you're not alone and here are the successes and here are the challenges and here are the considerations, but really understanding, you know, getting more into Holly, which you mentioned some of the complexities of DEI, what's the role of the leader? Um, are there other things that need to be in place in order for this to work or for this to be effective? So I think, let's see, I named like four things. I think that should take me to 2024. <laughs> <laughs> Quinetta, when you think about the sort of broader network or broader range of research that's going on in this space, what really gets you excited? What are the really cutting edge questions that people are asking about diversity, equity, and inclusion? I think that we have become stuck in this best practice space and people want to know what are the best practices. There are, you know, there are awards for best practices. There are, you know, things written about lists of best practices. But I think even though we read and we hear about those things, where organizations struggle is that when one organization says it's a best practice, really what that means is it's best for them. And so why does it work, right? And 
what makes it work or what are the things that they experience that always work? Were there times that it didn't work? How has it evolved? And so I think that some organizations are still trying to understand what do we do? And the challenge is that it's not a one size fits all. I can't just say, you know what, go get diversity training and that'll fix everything because it, it can't. And diversity training differs or, you know, recruiting initiatives, building a pipeline, where you go and, and who you need, those things all differ. And so I think I get a lot of questions about the how, like, how do we go about doing this? Another thing, a question is about leadership, how to train leaders, how to develop leaders so that they're more inclusive because as many practices as we might put in place, those practices have to be enacted. And so we need people who are good leaders, that this is just part of what they do. And no matter who is on their team, that they can deal with those differences, they can treat people fairly, and they can create an environment where everyone can succeed. So that becomes uh, another question and then, um, you know, people just love seeing the outcomes, the financial data. If you can show, you know, that we were able to, you know, this related to some kind of key performance indicator, we were able to increase our revenues or we were able to grow by this much. People love that kind of stuff. And so they'll usually ask me, give me a company, give me a name of an organization who does it well. And everybody doesn't do everything well but I can give them examples of outcomes and those considerations and things they need to think about. So, so, you know, one of the things I'm excited about right now is being able to really make evidence-based solutions to this or to really give people guidance that they can use tomorrow. And I think that's, really overall what organizations are craving. We're beyond the con conceptual, we're beyond the theoretical, but how do I do this? And how do I get the most return, the biggest and fastest return on my investment um, to be able to show that it actually is, is meaningful? Um, but then also, you know, organizations have ways that they determine their effectiveness. People are evaluated on a quarter and an annual basis. So how do I become more effective overall as well? And so I think people understanding what's in it for them and how to actually do it is really what the, the burning platform is. Yeah. And it seems like the, you know, to drive at and sort of identify some of those evidence-based solutions really requires digging into the how, as you said, right? Mm -hmm. Like how is it that diversity, you know, what are the conditions necessary such that diversity can produce value for individuals and for the organization, right? How is it that diversity, equity, and inclusion interlock to, you know, produce that magic, as you said earlier? So, you know, I think for me too, that's a really exciting area for us to dig into is that, you know, like what is it about these things that makes them work, both in terms of improving individuals' well-being and in terms of improving firm performance? Yeah. This topic feels like in particular, too, maybe even more so than some of our other research topics, that it's very conducive to in-person conversations. So I'm very excited about the events that, that we're going to have and bring people together to talk about this, because I think that's when a lot of things actually get activated and people actually get it when you just are together talking about this. And um, there's just something about it that d doesn't get translated quite as well through written word. And so I'm very excited about that. Our first event for this center is going to be in September in Philadelphia. Yeah. Quinetta, can you maybe talk a little bit about, you know, the theme for that event and, you know, what people might expect from being able to come together and talk in person around this topic? I agree with Holly that being able to talk about it is important. Um, from the standpoint of, you know, when you get people together and we can do some collaborative problem solving and learning, that's what diversity is actually about, right? That's the, that's the beauty of it. That's where the magic happens. And so 
the the title is Beyond Diversity, the Value and Impact of DEI for Credit Unions. And I think, and I and I use those words in our conversation time and time again, but value and impact. I think that a lot of times when people hear diversity and or inclusion, it conjures up pictures of like, you know, a circle where people are like holding hands and seeing Kumbaya, there might be some tears or something like that. <laughs> and and it's not this, you know, business imperative. But when I talk about DEI, and this probably, I'm a product of my, you know, background, my, my work experience, but I actually start with the end story, right? At the end of a quarter, or at the end of a year, how do you know that you've been successful or how do you know that you've been effective? Part of that is people understanding their metrics, understanding their strategy, just understanding their business. Then we can start to back into the DEI story, right? So how do people relate to those metrics and that strategy and how work gets done? And then what are the ways that diversity, equity, and inclusion that you see now either drives that or hinders that. And if it drives it, we want to leverage that and do more of that. And if it hinders it, we want to figure out how to address that. And so I think, you know, that understanding where the levers are to create value and understanding really how to leverage DEI to make credit unions bigger, faster, stronger, whatever it is, more effective overall, that's what we want to talk about or, or that's what my goal is that we do talk about. We wrestle with that and we walk away at least all feeling like we've had some idea how to do it better. And we've drawn from, from all of the expertise, the knowledge, the experience in the room. That's fantastic. I'm, I know I'm excited to uh, be a fly on the wall in that room. So Quinetta, you're a researcher, you're a professor, you're a teacher, you've done consulting work, um, but obviously in this world, uh, you know, we all do, we're all more than our jobs. So can you tell us a little bit about what you do in your, your kind of non-professor time? Uh, I do research. No. Um. <laughs> <laughs> like, like all good academics, you, uh, you read books and think <laughs> right. 100% no, of the I, time. So I actually do read books. Um, I, I read because I usually read in the evenings. I remember when I was trying to get tenure, I remember this one period of time when I feel like I was doing statistics in my sleep and I was like, this is not good. I will, <laughs> no. I will have a beautiful mind sooner than I want to. <laughs> it's not sustainable. So, right. So I decided to, that I needed to decompress and, and I love reading. So that helps me do that. Um, but I'm a podcast junkie. I am an adrenaline junkie. So anything that moves like fast and is slightly dangerous, I kind of love. But wow. under that umbrella, um, I really I'm an avid snowboarder. Cool. That's really cool. Um, I didn't know that. Yes. And uh, and I'm a trained sommelier. That is so interesting. Tell us more about that. How did you get into um, into wine? I just drank a lot. No, um, <laughs> We're all sommeliers then. <laughs> oh, I am not. <laughs> well, I mean, if just drinking a lot is the only qualification. <laughs> so, you know, I was a professor at Cornell, which is located in upstate New York in the Finger Lakes region, which um, at the time was the second most wine producing state New York was the second most wine producing state after California. I think it's Oregon now in the New York. But um, there's the Finger Lakes Wine Festival is every year. And I would go every year with friends. And probably after about five years, this woman at a vineyard said, well, you obviously know wine and love wine. Do you want to pour wine? And I was like, eh, I don't need another job. <laughs> and she said, oh, because you get paid in wine. And I was like, oh. Okay. <laughs> in that case. Oh, yeah, I heard angels singing. And so um, I started working wine competitions. Um, I was actually the my role was the person who ran the scoring sheets after the judges had scored the wines. 
and I got to talk to them about like what was it about wine, the wine that they thought were award winners, etc. Um, and so I just got to learn a little bit. But then when I moved to back to Philadelphia, I thought my wine career was over, but there was a wine school in the city, and I took two classes that required me to do like blind tastings and take exams. And the instructor said, you know, if you take like six more classes, you can get a degree. And the overachiever of me said, <laughs> oh, okay, I need a bachelor's in wine. <laughs> Sounded so, like a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So uh, I did that. And in 14, I got a baccalaureate devant. My French is awful, but that's what it was. Um, but I can't really carry my wine degree around and people always want to ask questions. Well, is it accredited? And when, you know, whatever. And so, um, I took level one of the guild of master sommeliers exam. If you've ever seen the documentary Psalm, mm -hmm. they're studying for their level four. I took and passed level one and you get a pin when you pass. And so the, I've been in different places and different countries with the pin on and people have recognized it. So, um, gives me a little cachet. Yeah. That's yeah. Um, oh, just a, quite a bit of cred seems to yeah. me. Yeah. Um, level two has a service component, which I was studying for cause I'm not in the industry. Um, and so I need to make that part of my muscle memory mm -hmm. cause you have to like, how do you, you have to open champagne without it making a noise? Um, you have to, pour it from the dimple at the bottom of the bottle. You have to mm -hmm. fold a serviette and I don't know how to do that stuff. So <laughs> I've got to learn. And most of the people in the city who are studying for their level three and level four, I know them and they've invited me to join them, but their study sessions are like 12 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. after they get off work. Oh, so right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's not conducive to a professor schedule. No, but maybe maybe we can build some opportunities for practice in the future filing events. Definitely practice. And I, I, I also want to figure out a way to I have a, a wine study in mind. So that's awesome. That sounds awesome. Maybe we need to put a little wine study in the filing offices. <laughs> yeah. I think I need to brush up my beer knowledge with more wine knowledge so we can um, we can trade notes because um, yeah, I, I always am looking for learning more about wine. Yeah, you have to be well-rounded. Yeah, exactly. I'm always looking to be served uh, <laughs> wine, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can come practice. Yeah, anytime. No, that that's really that's really cool. I mean, I, I think it's awesome for listeners to hear uh, the kind of story behind the mm -hmm. research, so to speak. Um, yeah. Re you know, professors are human beings like everybody else, although... Um, it doesn't always seem that way. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I think it's a really awesome story to hear about your snowboarding and, um, you know, uh, wine knowledge prowess. <laughs> yeah. And, and I have to ask, since you said you were a podcast junkie, so besides the Filene Fill-In podcast, what is your favorite podcast to listen to? Oh, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm channeling my husband because there's some that like, he says I either have boring podcasts or I have ratchet podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> so he would be embarrassed either way. Um, Maybe give us one of each category. One of each. <laughs> I love Ted Radio Hour, but now the host Guy Raz is leaving. And so I don't know if that's going to change it. So they're in this transition period right now. But so if, given that that's in transition, it would either be wait, wait, don't tell me or code switch. Mm -hmm. They're kind of all NPR ones. Mm -hmm. um, Ratchet one, T.I. has a podcast <laughs> <laughs> called Expeditiously, which is probably terrible, but I, I love it. <laughs> that's awesome. That is awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> all right. Good recommendations for our listeners. Holly, do you, have any, yeah. do you have any podcast recommendations? I know. I'm always with. taking recommendations. Yeah. Um, I love Hidden Brain. Um, oh, yeah. But I, I'm like you. I'm all about the NPR ones and WNYC yep. Studios podcasts. They're all oh, good. Yeah. Yep. Any one of those you can't go wrong with. One of uh, one of Filene Fellows was just on the Hidden Brain. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
Yeah. Oh, I have to so go maybe, check that one out. Yeah. Quinetta, maybe we can get you on the hidden brain next. Yeah, you are an overachiever, so. <laughs> Maybe, I would love it. Maybe like, we need to set that as a as one of our outcome goals for the mm-hmm, center. Mm-hmm. Well, I I heard um, I think in the other podcast I think um, Seku said he was a podcast junkie and he was like, if you like podcasts, you're a nerd or something. <laughs> yeah. And and he said and you and Holly, you said that there was like a bad nerd and a good nerd. Yeah, there is. <laughs> <laughs> The joke so in the hidden office. Brain, hidden brain is good nerd? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be good nerd okay. for yeah. sure. Okay. You know. The joke okay. in the office is that I don't like podcasts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't? I'm the only one apparently in the world. Yeah. No, you like vehemently hate them, <laughs> but you are on them and you like that. <laughs> I, li- I think that that is the problem is that the <laughs> podcast needs less of people like me on them. Honestly, we need we need a DEI initiative for podcasting. <laughs> well, yeah, so you know, that. <laughs> my analogy to that is that I hate chocolate. And everyone thinks that I'm like out of my mind. They're like, how is that possible? And I told the folks at work that I we didn't have an inclusive environment because all you find was chocolate <laughs> in the in the school. And so they were like so then like the admin got me the 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 worst but the most delicious um like candy, like Halloween candy. So Yeah. So if you're if you're not into chocolate, are you more of like a savory you're yeah. more into like savory flavors? Yep. I think that's acceptable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I like being around people that don't like chocolate because that means there's more chocolate for me. I don't know why people would want everybody else to like the same things that they like. Yeah, then, then you're just competing for the yeah. same limited resource. Yeah. And this that feels like is what that takes us full circle to DEI, right? <laughs> exactly. You don't want to be around fellow chocolate lovers they don't even want to be around people who like different things yeah i just discovered with my marketing team that we had a bag of starburst and there were four of us and each one of us had a a different color preference and i was like you guys this is 100 percent perfect we are the perfect team for splitting a bag of starburst (laughs) what's your preference mine is the orange oh huh Mm mm-hmm I was really surprised that we had somebody that liked the lemon because that... I love me, lemon. See? <laughs> see, that's awesome. To me, the lemon tastes like like the way Pledge smells. So I would give you all the lemons. I listened to a podcast, a, a, an episode of a podcast that was entitled, The Lemon Starburst is Trash. <laughs> really? And I was like, that's aggressive. I felt that was too aggressive. That's too much. That's like a, that's, too much. That. that's a step yeah. too far. I feel like... <laughs> You you can you can express your preferences or dispreferences, but that don't don't go yeah. trashing other right. people. Right. Yeah. Watch watch the words you use, right? Exactly. That's about inclusion. <laughs> you can't marginalize people. Let's let's really work on our cultural belonging. People. I'm glad right. that somebody likes the lemons because I don't want them to go to waste. And they just well, build I don't up. like the cherry, so I'm using yeah. everybody's friend. Yeah. I, I like them all. I do. Taylor. I don't. I actually don't think I have a <laughs> preference among Starburst. Yeah. You just want to eat the whole bag. By I, w- I would eat the whole bag. Yes, that's true. <laughs> You're not discriminating. <laughs> yeah. I was about to make a joke about being colorblind, but I won't do that. <laughs> Maybe at one of our first know. reports needs to be like analogies of, of chocolate and candy and all of that when we try to explain DEI. It sounds like a good April <laughs> April 1st yeah. DEI well, I report. At, I think at the event, that's like we, we can almost do a, a study where we have like some chocolate and some Starburst. And like something else out and see which ones go faster. Ooh. Ooh. I like that. Or or we could use it as a as a prop and some kind of uh, workshop on, you know, how to strategize yep. for inclusive organizations. Yep. Mm-hmm. Cool. I like the way you think. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so much work to do that we we all need to go get to it and um, figure out that Starburst game now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for um, lending your time to us today. This has been a really fun conversation, and uh, I really look forward to all the stuff that um, comes out of the center, and particularly, you know, from from your research and from your passion on this topic. I think we're really fortunate to have you. Well, I thank you for having me. Thank you for, you know, slow walking me through this, particularly with um, probably seventy percent of a voice. 
Um, but it's it's been a great I've enjoyed the conversation and I don't know if it's possible, but I'm even more excited about um, the center. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Quinetta. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. All right, that's it for the fill-in, folks. Thank you for listening. And thank you so very, very much, Quinetta, for taking the time to speak with us with only 70% of your voice and despite having to go off and teach several hours of classes afterward. You really are an overachiever, and we're all lifted because of your dedication to your work. I also want to thank Filene's credit union partners, without which this work would not be possible. Generous support for the Center of Excellence for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion is provided by State Department Federal Credit Union, Suncoast Credit Union, United Nations Federal Credit Union, UW Credit Union, and Exceed Financial Federal Credit Union. If you're listening and feeling inspired and wondering what you can do to get more involved in this work, your organization, too, has an opportunity to get involved as a supporter and partner in our inner circle. Visit filene.org slash inner circle for more information. And if you want to learn more about the center's inaugural research event that we mentioned on September 15th and 16th in Philadelphia, visit filene.org slash events for details. Lastly, if you like this episode, please do rate us on Apple Podcasts so more people can find us. And make sure you're subscribed to the Filene Fill-In Podcast so you can keep up with what's going on at Filene. You'll find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. To get in touch about today's show, email me at hollyf at filene.org or find us on Twitter at Filene Research. Until next time, thanks everyone.